LED lighting has been a phenomenal contributor to reducing the total amount of electrical usage worldwide. So that's gone from about 18% down to 13, 12% now. The belief is that over the next five or 10 years, we can get that 12 to 13% down to about 8%. Hello, I'm Sue Nelson and welcome to the Create the Future podcast, brought to you by the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering, celebrating engineering visionaries and inspiring creative minds. Today's guest has combined an engineering background and entrepreneurial spirit to forge a career path encompassing consultancy and becoming a CEO of the world's leading lighting company. Canadian Stephen Ruat is the CEO of the UK and Ireland markets for Signify, formerly known as Philips Lighting. The company began in the Netherlands over 125 years ago, and the chances are that if you've ever bought an indoor or outdoor light, whether filament, LED or halogen, it was probably one of theirs. Stephen is also a member of several World Economic Forum committees related to engineering and construction, infrastructure and urban development. So it will come as no surprise to learn that his degree is in civil engineering and his childhood involved both an entrepreneurial interest and certain games beloved of budding engineers around the world. Growing up, I probably used more Lego, Meccano, anything you could basically get your hands on to build. I was basically fascinated by sort of as a kid. And then I'd say importantly, I had an uncle who had an Amiga computer, which he uh, uh, let me start playing with as an early teenager. And I probably couldn't let go of it. It was really interesting and fascinating for me, just sort of the, 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 the technology within it. And he was writing video games at the time. And I was just fascinated by the whole thing. And then, to be fair, I was just lucky that my dad also was one of those people that was constantly fixing things. We had a cottage that that there always seemed to be something to to, to fix. And and then, to be fair, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, my father started his own company probably when I was about six or seven years old. And so I basically just grew up in a family of entrepreneurs. So constantly learning the the pressures and challenges of running your own business uh, and just how to be creative to make it work. So was that sort of interest in building, creating things led you to study civil engineering? I found all engineering really interesting. And it could have been computers, civil. My grandfather had actually been a materials engineer. And so engineering itself looked really interesting. So I went to the University of Toronto and a couple of other universities, um, kind of like away days. You go for the weekend, you, you check it out. Um, and I just found everything they were trying to do really fascinating, all the programs interesting, and actually the people there were really interesting as well. And I said, okay, engineering is the place for me. And then it was a question of which discipline. And for me, I really enjoyed buildings, architecture. And I said, uh, I, I guess my love of Lego at an early age said, okay, let's go with civil. Uh, and that's how I, uh, I got started. When you did your master's, I saw that you'd taken an entrepreneurship option. Obviously, well, as you say, you grew up surrounded by on entrepreneurs, but what did that entrepreneurship option include? There was a combination of engineering, some maths, but really business and, and, and a commercial mindset. And so for me, growing up with a love of engineering, uh, with an entrepreneurial family, it was a great opportunity to kind of apply engineering and maths in, in real world problems. Uh, because we had the chance to work with large commercial enterprises. Uh, we were sponsored by a set of the big banks, one of the uh, uh, major telcos, uh, and you got to work with real people on real problems as part of your research. So, so it was really fascinating for me, while also working on a bunch of technology and computer stuff. So it was a chance to go from civil to kind of entrepreneurial and, and technology. And also incredibly useful for engineers, so many of whom go into setting up their own businesses uh, as well. Was that ever on your mind, like, I I will use this option to learn how to set up my own business? Absolutely. This was back in the dot-com era when uh, I think everybody was starting their own business of something. And it's something that's still on my mind in terms of, you know, my family still has their own business that's been quite successful. And the question is, for me at some point, would I ever go off and do my own business? Not sure yet. I quite like being able to take a lot of the entrepreneurial learnings that I had from early on and to be able to apply them in a large corporation is actually quite valuable. Uh, don't need to leave just yet to start my own company, but it's something that's always sits in the back of my head. What was your first job then from leaving university? My first real, real job 
after university would have been with Accenture, the uh, consulting company. And I was working on in their technology strategy group. And what did that involve? It was actually a really cool job. So you got to basically travel around the world. Uh, (laughs) In this instance, I was I first started off working across working across North America working with senior executives on technology related problems. So either the CEO would hire you in to solve kind of a, a really help better understand to get the value out of technology, how to re-transform, let's say, the, the, the architecture of the company or drive more revenues out of technology or be hired by the CIO in some ways to combat the CEO or to help them better prove the great work they were doing or really just transform their business. And this form of consulting effectively did what you were trained for make this sort of area and this avenue and direction come easy to you? Yeah, absolutely. Engineers make often great consultants. And whether that's with the, the big four, big five, whether with the Baines, BCGs and McKinsey's or the whole broader range of, of consulting roles that exist out there, engineering teaches you problem solving, working in teams, numbers, And you really apply all of those things in a consulting role. So it was literally hand in glove for what I wanted to do. I was quite interested when I was sort of researching your career in terms of how while you were working as a consultant, it looks like you still kept up that interest in engineering in terms of being involved with quite a lot of engineering committees and leading national engineering conferences. I mean, that sounds like a a, a sort of deliberate, you wanted to keep those things in parallel. Early on, so while I was in engineering, if there was, uh, I was heavily involved in the engineering society, also with arranging the, the, in Canada, the national engineering conference. And I'd say, I've always tried to stay in touch beyond just the day-to-day work that I've been involved in, into larger things where you can make, make a difference, let's say, outside of your existing role. So now I'm currently involved in the Lighting Industry Association. I do work with the World Economic Forum, UK Green Building Council, and so forth, really to provide an outsized role outside of just what I do day to day to to have a bigger impact on society, industry, to kind of have more positive benefits. So it's something I've always tried to do more of. Do you now, you know, with all that experience behind you, can you sort of tell instantly whether organizations are going to sort of rise or fall? Well, if I could do that really well, I, I would probably be uh, uh, working for a large scale investment firm and, <laughs> and picking all the winners. It's hard to be. You really see companies can come up with great ideas or individuals can come up with great ideas and they never, they, they're never able to commercialize them or it takes two or three goes before you get the really the right model that lands. Philips is a great example of coming up with a, a whole series of great innovations that they didn't necessarily be first, they weren't necessarily the first to market with commercializing them and others potentially were more successful. It's really hard to be able to predict what's going to be a clear winner. Blockchain's a great example. It's going to work. The question is, how and in what uh, uh, how is that technology going to be best applied and what's going to be the the, the 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 most interesting set of use cases that really help it take off so it's hard to pick winners you can get a general feel for it. this looks like something that's going to be a winner over the longer term but who the individual that actually picks up the solution gets the first business case right gets the first set of customers right and then runs with it it's always hard to guess and Philips Lighting, which is now known as Signify, is, is that one of the reasons that attracted you to join the company because you saw the potential there? Oh, absolutely. Philips has been around for about 130 years. So Philips, Philips Lighting now Signify uh, for the group that I'm part of. And obviously, uh, we're one of the first manufacturers of light bulbs, but then really extended it into a whole range of different solutions, different products. And whether that was the compact disc player, audio cassette tapes, they have a whole set of personal product divisions and so forth. They have such a broad range of interesting technologies and different product areas and a huge historical focus on innovation. So the chance to work there in a business that invests so much into innovation and has such a culture of creating the new was really uh, interesting for me. So so that, that engineering Uh, That engineering passion that I had moving from financial services, which is more digital products to Philips, Philips Lighting and now Signify, which is more, let's say, physical products was really interesting for me. And as you know, this year, five engineers who played a role in LED 
lighting innovations were the recipients of the Queen Elizabeth Prize for engineering. It can at first glance, I think, seem that the way we illuminate our just a simple thing like lighting up our our rooms hasn't changed that much over the years but actually there has been a lot of innovation and engineering uh, in terms of where we were then and and where we are now hasn't there oh absolutely you know you can go back to uh, they always say 1015 is when uh, uh, ibn al hatham i'll never get his name right uh, had the book of optics uh, it was in 1015 um, and then you really see the evolution of the thinking and engineering around lighting the nature of light magnetic waves the use of optical fibers culminating into the first filament light bulb more than 100 years ago and then since then you've gone from let's say 10 lumens per watt from an efficiency standpoint all the way up to 200 lumens per watt and more Uh, so from an efficiency standpoint lighting has changed so much in terms of its power output its efficiency but more importantly as it's gone from conventional incandescent to fluorescent and hid and now to solid state and led lighting as part of this whole evolution the applications for lighting have grown multitudes. You know, you can take a look at how lighting used to be. If you think back to to 25 years ago, 50 years ago, you'd have one light point, one light in your room. So you'd have a, a desk lamp or you'd have a light on the ceiling. And that was it. And now if you look in any room now, there might be 10, 20, 30, 40 different lights and being used in different ways, whether it's light strips, lights embedded in products, obviously lights in your ceilings and so forth. And how we use them has changed as well. And now, instead of lighting just providing pure illumination, it's also used as a signaling uh, method. You can use colors to shape ambience and to actually provide a a physical feeling for people. And that's just in the household and the office space. So what you have now is with human-centric lighting, where light actually imparts a, uh, a feeling or behavior on you. It helps you get over jet lag quicker. It helps you be more relaxed. And you can obviously have the light change over the course of the day to make you more energized or more relaxed. So that works for people, as I said, in offices or in a home, but lighting can now be used for things like agriculture, where you have horticultural lighting, and whether it's in a vertical farm or in a greenhouse, helping plants grow more healthily, quicker, really improving the overall efficiency of agriculture production. So there's a huge role to play for lighting in the, in the coming years on making agriculture more efficient. And the same goes true for animals as well, where it can be used to basically help, uh, and whether that's pigs, chickens, uh, uh, cows, and so forth, be uh, more relaxed, grow more quickly, be more healthy, all the way through to, so you basically have plants, animals, people, lighting has an impact on all of those. But, but then you also have things like ultraviolet and infrared lighting. Ultraviolet lighting actually has been quite handy for uh, disinfection. So it's been used throughout the years for everything from tanning beds to killing insects in in one of those little bug trays. But now you can use ultraviolet lighting as a disinfection tool for combating things like COVID, SARS, MRSA, the superbugs, uh, influenza, and so forth. So so you can really see how lighting has gone from just lighting a room to providing physical benefits for people, plants, and animals to these new applications around disinfection. And I'd say probably one of the more interesting ones is using lighting for the transmission of data, Li-Fi. So you can actually use a light bulb, a specific light source, LED, all the way through to infrared to be able to transmit data. And you can get up to, you know, one gigabit, 10 gigabits a second. And we're now seeing all sorts of interesting use cases where we're using lights to transmit data. And whether that's in the home, the office, there's a lot of commercial uh, opportunities as well across aerospace, defense, and so forth. So lighting has gone from this this very simple light the room all the way through to some of the most interesting applications possible for the coming years. That's fascinating, isn't it? Obviously, the increase in the use of of lighting, particularly within the home, how do you balance that with the desire to be more energy efficient, particularly with people concerned about climate change? And that's been one of the great things about the evolution of lighting. As I mentioned, we've gone from 10 lumens a watt to 200 lumens a watt. And once you factor in things like systems or controls that allow you to have the lights on only when you need them, for example, when you step into a room or the you know, motion sensor detects you, when you take a look at, I'd say maybe 10 years ago, lighting took up about 18, 19% of all electricity usage worldwide. Now, 
over time with the introduction of LED lighting and these systems and controls, that's gone from about 18% down to 13, 12% now. So even though there's more light points, we're using less electricity for them. And when you take a look at the numbers, the belief is that over the next five or 10 years, we can get that 12 to 13% down to about 8%. So actually, LED lighting has been a, a phenomenal contributor to actually reducing the total amount of electrical usage, electricity usage worldwide. Uh, and it's one of the easiest ways to make your home more sustainable because you can basically replace all your conventional lighting immediately. And you'll see if you just screw in a new light bulb and you'll see a, a, a substantial reduction in electric, electricity usage. If you basically go from about, depending on the, the, the light bulb you've got in there, anywhere from 50 to 70% uh, uh, reduction in electricity use. So actually, as an end consumer or even in an office space or anywhere, switching the light bulbs out, uh, switching all the, the, the lighting that's in your house or in your office to LED lighting and then putting in some controls over top can actually help you become more sustainable. And it's probably one of the easiest things to do versus replacing a boiler or putting insulation all around your home. Will those future reductions come from engineering refinement of existing technology or will it require another sort of step change with the current set of technology so led controls the, the belief is to get it's possible to get from the 13 to 8 i have no doubts that further potential beyond that is, is available if you think about improving in the materials the electrical controls tied to that we've already seen you know that that, that lumen per watt going from the 10 to 200 you know going from 200 to 300 in a commercial option is very much there so when you think about material engineering, electrical engineering, uh, a lot of manufacturing processes, there's a lot of places where engineering will have a role to play in driving lighting to being even more efficient. I have no doubts of that. And you've worked across the world. You've traveled a lot. Do you notice uh, any difference between different countries' attitudes towards engineering? It's a great question. I would honestly say that most places I've been across the world Engineering has, has often been regarded as a, a, a profession with a, a degree of study, an area of study that, that's interesting, has a good reputation, you know, like medicine. You know, it's one of those things where everybody likes doctors. It's, they, they provide a, a societal good. The same is true for engineers. Everybody appreciates the benefits, uh, from what I've seen at least, that engineering brings, and regardless across the world. Obviously, in some markets, engineers are held to a higher standard or a higher regard uh, and have a, a stronger place in society. But I'd say pretty much everywhere I've seen that, that everyone's gone, ah, engineer, really interesting. And how do you relax? Well, I've got a couple kids. They, I think that's called relaxing. <laughs> um, for me personally, and I think it is really important that every person really finds ways to have those personal timeouts uh, and just have something other than work and work. You know, I'm sure Elon Musk takes two minutes off a day or something for something other than work. But for me, sports has always played, athletics has always played a really strong aspect, you know, played a strong role or uh, been a strong, uh, um, very present in my life. And whether that's basketball, baseball, skiing, I've, I've always tried to do lots of sports in that sense, spending time with family. And then actually, something that I've had to do as part of my work uh, has been something that I've always loved. I've loved traveling. I love different, seeing different cultures, languages, food, uh, photography. So I've been fortunate that, you know, my career over the past years has really allowed me to go around the world and, and actually do a bunch of my hobbies. So if you happen to be working in the Middle East, having your camera with you um, and really being able to go out and meet new people, uh, try the foods and just explore the area has been a great way to detox and, and take a step back from whatever work that I'm deeply involved in at the time. And what advice would you give to engineers who also see themselves as, as going down the route that you've gone in terms of consulting and then eventually CEO and, and more on the business side of things? So you've made a great choice, firstly. Engineering is a great base uh, uh, to step into a commercial role. I would really encourage you, while you're in your studies, definitely read the business newspapers. Be involved in things like engineering competitions. I really find that the, the getting from theoretical to applied, regardless of the discipline, uh, was really critical in just 
you know, helping shape a, a lot of the problem solving and, and, and putting things into action that you eventually need in the, the, the commercial world. Really get work experience early. A summer job, part-time job, anything just to, to really just get your feet wet from a commercial standpoint. And then I'd say importantly, great, you, you, you've stayed in touch, you, you, you've kept up to date on, on the way the world works, all the business newspapers, really being involved in, in a lot of the applied parts of, of engineering that there is. As part of that first job, really pick a place where you're going to learn. There's some really cool jobs that are good for the job itself, but I think it's really important to try and pick a job that helps set your base for a career. Obviously, consulting was one of those, and it's, it's not the only uh, profession you can go into, but consulting for me really set a great, strong base for uh, seeing a broad range of companies, a broad range of problems, uh, working with a broad range of people, and really always being acutely aware of that commercial business case aspect of, of that all companies drive themselves by. Obviously, you can learn that in many different environments, but for me, really finding a, uh, that first role out of, out of university was really critical in terms of setting the base that I could build a career off of for the longer term. And as CEO, I suppose I have to ask a former consultant, have you negated the need for consultants now for, for yourself and your company? No, actually, that's, uh, consultants are useful. They need to be used the right way. I've seen a lot of instances, both while I was uh, in consulting and as somebody who's hired consultants, where consultants haven't been used the right way. They've been misused. They're brought in to solve the wrong problem, or you're not quite sure what problem it is to solve. It is phenomenal to be able to bring in, whether it's three, five, 10, 15 super smart people uh, with a broad range of experiences who've seen a specific problem elsewhere. You're a company, you're struggling with a problem you've not solved it yourself, you've not seen it yourself, being able to bring in five or 10 people who are dedicated and focused on that specific problem and can bring relevant examples and experiences from wherever they've come from, especially if it's from different industries, so you can bring in these new learnings, really can bring a a phenomenal benefit to a company and help them make a step change, especially if they're doing a new business, launching a new set of products, expanding into a new area, or trying to improve in some way they haven't done before. So it's a great way to learn. Now, of course, You can do it the wrong way. You already know the answer. You're kind of just looking for somebody to rubber stamp it. You know, the team that's brought in really don't have the experiences. They may be three or four really smart people, but, you know, they kind of haven't done it before. So they kind of end up playing back to the same answer you always knew. The old analogy of, uh, you know, they'll they'll basically take the watch off your arm and then tell you what the time is. So that's how it, it can be done wrong. So important is really have the problem in mind really say we need to use an external third party because they're going to bring the expertise and knowledge that's going to help us crack it because we don't know that. And, and we're looking for very specific information. You really vet the company that you pick. And then you can really have a, a very strong positive impact from using a third party group like consultants. Stephen Ruat, thank you very much for joining me on the Create the Future podcast. Thanks, Sue. It was really great to be here. Find out more about the Queen Elizabeth Prize for Engineering by following QE Prize on Twitter and Instagram or visit qeprize.org. This is the last episode in Season 2 of Create the Future. We'll be back in January with Season 3. And in the meantime, catch up on Seasons 1 and 2 wherever you listen to your podcasts and tell us who you'd like to hear from next. Thanks for listening and do join me then. <music>